Great. So uh, welcome, everybody. We, we, we went over a little bit because folks were still coming in, and, and, and we just wanted to make sure that you were all were here so we could uh, get started with, the, with our great guest and, and also with the launching of, of this paper that I'm so proud uh, to do today. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Carl Meacham. I am the director here of the Americas program at CSIS. And uh, today we're here to launch uh, the Americas program's latest report entitled The Dominican Republic becoming a one-party state. Uh, the report is the culmination of a six-month project on corruption and the state of democracy in the Dominican Republic. We have Roberto Alvarez here with us to be a, a discussant of the report, but also to uh, uh, inform us, uh, to enlighten us uh, with his knowledge of, of the situation in the Dominican Republic as well. Uh, but for today's event, I'll be focusing uh, on uh, the Dominican Republic's political system, uh, uh, some of the problems that we saw during our trip and, and how they got there. Uh, we'll be holding a second event next month on December 11th to discuss the future trajectory of the country uh, when we'll be hosting the leaders of Dominican Republic's several political parties. Uh, you, you've all chosen to come to this event today, uh, so presumably you all hold some personal stake and the answers to all of the questions that we're going to attempt, or that I will attempt, uh, and, and Roberto uh, will attempt to answer today. Uh, but we carried out this project and wrote this report uh, because in many ways you are the exception. Uh, over the life of the project, I heard the same question many times. Uh, why the Dominican Republic? Why are you focusing so much on the Dominican Republic? Why is it so important? Uh, the country is, is a reliable U.S. ally with, at least from, first, from a first glance, a stable and democratic political system. Uh, though the U.S. Uh, is the Dominican Republic's biggest trade partner, the Dominican Republic is the U.S.'s 46th uh, largest trade partner. Uh, traditionally, uh, the U.S. policymaking community has a tendency to turn a blind eye, or at the very least, uh, to glaze over the challenges in countries friendly to our uh, regional interests. So. Um, we're trying to break with that, with that approach. Uh, but for all in, in the United States, um, we've come to count on the Dominican Republic as a stable and reliable partner. Um, there's still very much at stake. And the issues that we're going to address through this project, corruption, the rule of law, judicial independence, the state of democracy, would seem less pressing if it were not for the country's incredible promise. The Dominican Republic is the largest economy in, the central, in Central America and the Caribbean. And with its history of stable democracy, the country would be poised to, to take on a leadership role in the region and to expand its international profile. I say would because currently the Dominican Republic is holding itself back. The country's potential is impressive, but realizing, it's daunting, it, realizing it is daunting in light of the recent and ongoing developments in the political system. The island's strategic positioning in the midst of the illegal Caribbean flow of drugs as well as goods and people makes the effective administration of justice a, uh, a still higher stakes game, particularly in light of the challenges the Dominican Republic is facing today. And for better or worse, we can't ignore the effects uh, of any developments in the Dominican Republic on Haiti, a country that the U.S. government has committed almost $4 billion for hurricane relief efforts since 2010 alone, also for reconstruction and for development, and billions more over the course of the past decade. Uh, with high unemployment, an unreliable political system, and countless domestic challenges, Haiti cannot afford an unstable neighbor, and the United States cannot afford an increasingly unstable Haiti. And that tension between the country's potential and the challenges it currently faces brought us to this project. We conceived of this project as an assessment of those challenges. We, had, we heard rumors of corruption, of the apparent imbalance of the, of the party system, and of expanding executive influence. So we shaped our itinerary with that in mind and flew with two members of my staff to the Dominican Republic. While we were there, we met with a wide range of stakeholders and practitioners from all backgrounds, standing government, opposition, ruling party, civil society, private sector, current and former members of the judiciary, and media. 
in an effort to round out our assessment and ensure that any conclusions we came to were as robust and unbiased as possible. You can find a list of the meetings that we had on the 11, uh, page 11 of the report, uh, which is uh, on the web right now or will be in the next uh, hour or two. Uh, we heard about the dominance of the Dominican uh, Liberation Party, or the PLD, in every branch of government. The party currently controls the executive branch and holds a majority both in Congress and in the National Council uh, of Magistrates. That's the body that appoints the country's judiciary and prosecutors. 31 of the country's 32 senators are PLD members, uh, as is a full 60% of the House of Representatives even though the primary opposition party garnered over 40% of the popular vote in the 2012 elections. We heard about the fractured opposition that is no longer able to provide a viable alternative to PLD power, the Dominican Revolutionary Party, or PRD, has yet to reunify since a 2009 political pact between PRD and PLD leaders, uh, the so-called Blue Ties Pact. The pact, highly controversial within the PRD, divided the party, and rendered it incapable of presenting a coherent platform in opposition to the PLD. And we heard about how the same pact allowed for the restructuring of the Dominican judiciary process, uh, a process that we were told by many was partial uh, to the ruling party. As I understand it, this process included giving members of the judiciary significant weight in resolving both inter and intra party disputes, and given the widespread perception that the PLD carries perhaps undue influence in the judicial system, this raises questions about the capacity of the judiciary to fairly arbitrate disputes within the party system. The division of the PRD has, according to many of those we spoke with, been furthered by discretionary judicial decisions. While I'm not in a position to advocate for any particular law, Many in the opposition are currently pushing for the development of a law of partido, law of parties, ley de partidos, a law that would protect the multi-party system so central to Dominican democracy. Such a law would ideally ensure that the regulations that govern the Dominican party system would be equally and fairly applied to the country's several parties, irrespective of their current power in the political system. We heard about the population's quickly eroding faith in the judiciary as allegations of executive influence in the judicial system grow ever more numerous and better documented. The judiciary is seen as heavily influenced by the PLD, driving the development of a culture of impunity. As more and more citizens turn to extrajudicial, extrajudicial means to resolve disputes and manage conflicts. We heard reports of widespread bribery, corruption, and money laundering, both plaguing the public perceptions of government and crippling the Dominican private sector. According to members of the anti-PLD movement, who have compiled vast tracts of evidence to this effect, one former president and his, and his allies have used the Global Foundation for Democracy and Development, Funglode, to, uh, to launder enormous sums of cash in exchange for higher stakes government contracts. Private sector leaders cite these contracts and the bribes they claim the contracts entail as a source of primary frustration, and more importantly, of economic inefficiency to the sole benefit of the ruling party. We heard about the distortionary effects of corruption and clientelism on the Dominican uh, economy. The informal sector reportedly constitutes nearly half of the country's economy, with the state's corruption providing little incentive for formal sector operations. Employment in the formal private uh, sector grew by just 5% over the last decade, while employment in the public sector increased by a staggering 37% apparently speaking both to the effects of PLD policies on the economy and to the ballooning of the federal government. And we heard about all of the dangers these developments pose for the country's political stability and democratic foundations, not to mention the implications any changes in that stability would have within Dominican borders and throughout the region. The fragility inherent in the Dominican Republic's geographic position and the Caribbean directly en route from the northern coast of South America, Venezuela, and Colombia, uh, and to southern states, puts it at a distinct disadvantage. Drug cartels operating in the region increasingly use the country's ill-policed coast as a point of transit. A full 14% of US-bound cocaine shipments were trafficked through the Caribbean in the first half of this year alone, largely by means of the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. 
and Dominicans make up the fourth largest Latino group in the United States. With upwards of 1.5 million uh, Dominicans currently living in U.S. borders. If the situation on the island continues to worsen, the implications for immigration flows northward and thus for the United States could be huge. So we came back, we wrote this report about everything we heard. If you didn't pick up a copy on your way in, don't worry, the report is already uh, up on our website or will be in the next hour uh, at csis.org uh, forward slash Americas uh, for you to go to, uh, to that website and for the folks that are watching on the webcast. Um, and it's under the publications section. Uh, but I'm not here to only provide uh, these facts that are a bit uh, pessimistic um, about Dominican Republic's future. Uh, we've written this report uh, because the country doesn't have to continue down the path it's currently on. Uh, I'm not Dominican, but uh, I, we recognize very clearly uh, the potential that the island has uh, and the people of the island uh, being, uh, I guess, the core of that potential. Um, so to put it simply, it's not too late. Uh, the country would benefit from a set of, con, uh, of conversations and reevaluations uh, re of its current system and on three issues in particular. The first is the state of the Dom Dominican judiciary and the particular challenges it faces in the realm of independence and party influence. The second, the development of a law protecting the country's political parties or a ley de partidos uh, and its potential implications for a healthy multi-party democracy. And third, the future of the PRD and how it will move forward uh, given its current disunity and inability to present a viable opposition to the PLD. I won't go into uh, more depth for now because I want to open the floor uh, to our guest today, my friend Roberto Alvarez. Uh, Roberto is currently the general coordinator for Grupo Participación Ciudadana, Transparency International's branch in the Dominican Republic. Previously, he served as the ambassador of the Dominican Republic to the uh, OAS. I won't say more for now because you have his bio and you, you know how impressive Roberto is, but suffice it to say as well that uh, he's an expert on, on the issues uh, that I was mentioning before and that he will elaborate uh, on, and I couldn't have been happier um, uh, to have him here today and that he accepted our invitation. I should note, though, that he is speaking here as an independent citizen not the representative of any government or organization. Uh, the usual procedures uh, apply for today's event. We are on the record and recording audio to place on our website. Uh, we are also webcasting, as I mentioned, and live tweeting today's event for the benefit of our international followers. For the Q&A, I would ask that you just wait for one of our staff to come along with a microphone. They'll get to you. Please, uh, uh, please elaborate on who you are. Uh, what organization you work uh, for. I know that everybody is going to have uh, statements that they're going to want to make, and we, we welcome those things. But please keep it brief so we can get to everybody. And without further ado, uh, Roberto, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl, for your kind words, your kind introduction. Um, I want to, and Jill and uh, uh, Michael, thank you very much, and CSIS for the invitation. Um, I want to underline what uh, Carl said before, that I'm here speaking on a personal capacity, that I do not represent any of the groups. I'm not here speaking on behalf of Participación Ciudadana um, or anyone else. Um, there are a lot of sort of friendly faces in the audience, and I thank you all for coming uh, this morning. I um, feel like I'm almost preaching to the choir in a way. Um, but I also want to thank uh, CSIS for doing this report. Um, it is not a um, 
an everyday event. Um, it hasn't been in a while, actually, that a, um, a think tank in Washington has focused on the Dominican Republic. Actually, most U.S. citizens focus on the DR when Big Papi goes to bat. Um, and um, and, and uh, for those Boston fans, uh, congratulations. Um, but I want to um, um, underline, um, first, there is a, the report has a suggestive or uh, leading almost uh, title, uh, the Dominican Republic becoming a one-party state. Um, my answer uh, right up front is not yet. However, there are troubling signs, and I will develop my answer and address at the end, hopefully, how we can uh, break through this uh, moment. Um, let me underline something that I find striking in terms of the relationship between the Dominican Republic and the United States. In the report, you will see uh, some data as to the Dominican population in the United States, which is roughly a million and a half. Um, not many of them are undocumented illegal, and I'm not gonna go into that uh, at the moment, but here is part of the answer. Um, these are the number of permanent residences granted by the United States to Dominican citizens Look at the decade of 1990-1999, and look where the Dominican Republic ranks. This is all nationalities. Number four, first is Mexico, Philippines, Russia, Dominican Republic. In the decade of 2000-2009, went to fifth place, and in the last, uh, the years, 2010, 11, and 12, also in fifth place. That's ahead of Cuba, including all refugees from Cuba, all types of visas, and so on. So this, to me, is a very telling um, statistic in terms of the escape valve that, um, that has served well uh, different Dominican governments um, over the years. Um, and as a matter of fact, it, it to some degree also explains um, the relationship, the economic relationship with Haiti in terms of the lower um, wage, scale wage um, Haitians that are coming into the Dominican Republic and Dominicans that are leaving. But we have no time to go into that at the moment. Um, now, I think it would be important, it's important to mention that what's happening in the Dominican Republic um, is to some degree a regional phenomenon as well. Not the Dominican Republic alone, and I think the context is important. If you look, for example, talking about re-election, in the, the 2009-2012 electoral, presidential electoral cycle in Latin America, um, out of the 18 elections that took place, uh, 10 were re-elections, or the official party continued in power, more than half. Uh, of those 10, five were continuous re-elections. Um, now, in the next cycle, which began this year, 2013 through 2018, there are already one uh, Ecuador, uh, and um, probably another one, although it's not consecutive, but re-election in Chile in a few days. Um, next year, four possible re-elections, uh, Colombia, Brazil, Uruguay, and Bolivia, of which three of those are consecutive, would be consecutive. So, the concentration of power, I, I think you all know what is happening in many countries uh, throughout Latin America. So um, unfortunately, this is a, a regional-wide phenomenon that is occurring. Um, 
then in the case of the Dominican Republic, the context, you have to look at what has been going on in the last 20, 25 years as well. In terms of re-elections, basically the three major parties, well, one of them is no longer a major party, the reformist party of Balaguer is uh, a, a minor, very minor party now, but they have all attempted, the main leaders have attempted continuous re-election throughout our, the last three decades. So it isn't a single party that is responsible um, for the current uh, tendencies, although there are certain specific uh, um, uh, qualities to the current tendency that I will explain. Um, so um, Balaguer was in power for 22 years. The PRD have, uh, most of them have attempted, uh, of the presidents at the PRD party have attempted re-election at one point or another. Hippolito Mejia changed the constitution in 2002 um, to allow his own attempt at re-election, which he lost in 2004. So uh, there is a context to what is happening at the moment. Um, one of the concerns, for example, my mind, is for example, is President Fernandez's statement, recent statement, that the PLD is a factory or a machine for the fabrication of presidents. And that it is going to, his words, gravitate over uh, the Dominican, Dominican politics uh, until first, he said, until 2036. Then a little bit later, he amended and said until 2044, because that would be the bicentennial, Dominican bicentennial. Um, given the current situation in the Dominican Republic, the fact that he's been president three times, that he's already gearing up for a fourth um, uh, attempt in 2016, this, and given the current state of the opposition, it, it creates a, a tremendous unease in those that consider that the alternation in power, the change of parties, is absolutely necessary for a democratic process. Um, now, let me show you something about corruptions in the Dominican Republic and the importance of corruption in politics and in drug trafficking and, uh, and throughout the entire uh, uh, Dominican uh, society. First, you have what uh, Transparency International, uh, the last Corruption Perceptions Index, has ranked the Dominican Republic 118 of 176 countries. World Economic Forum ranked the Dominican Republic 105 out of 148. This is the latest with a score of 3.76 out of 7. Only Honduras, Paraguay, Venezuela, and Haiti rank lower than the DR. The most prob problematic factor for doing business in DR cited is corruption. Now, I pulled out, this is the first pillar in institutions uh, that, that the World Economic Forum uses in order to reach the score. To, out of a rank of 148, in terms of diversion of public funds, the Dominican Republic ranks 142. Public trust in politicians, 143. Judicial independence, 131. Favoritism in decision of government officials, 145. Wastefulness of government spending, 138. Reliability of police services, 143. Now, I need to state at this point in time that it doesn't make me happy to be sort of showing this scores here, okay? It is, as a Dominican, I feel tremendously ashamed. And if I do so, is with the hope that by denouncing this situation, a change will eventually come about. Um, you have probably all heard of WikiLeaks, I gather. Um, these are just two samples of numerous samples of cables out of the U.S. Embassy 
one, 2008, regarding Forbes Energy, proposed investment in sugarcane. Um, a Forbes official told Ambassador Fannin that um, a cabinet, one cabinet minister had asked them for a $10 million to get all necessary permits. That allegation of that cabinet minister, that cabinet minister is a high government officials in the current administration. Another one uh, regarding Advent International. Um, said that the U.S. Embassy, that, uh, that a government of the DR official had harassed, threatened, and sought bribes from the company. And it goes on. Uh, uh, this is what the embassy reported, that the advent experience is unfortunately typical of foreign investors who arrive in the DR. And it goes on to say that another a Dominican uh, told the economic officer at the embassy that this other company, Advent, needed to aplatanarse, a term that refers to learning to behave like a Dominican in order to survive. Then the embassy says, yet if Dominican government officials wish to attract and retain foreign investors, they cannot require these investors to participate in the rampant corruption of negocios aplatanados, Dominican business style. It is the local business climate that needs to reform, not the foreign investors. Um, and this is the latest 2012 investment climate statement in the Dominican Republic. State Department, uh, you can basically uh, find it yourself. It, it is the same gist of what I was uh, saying before. Um, now. What is, is this anything new? Corruption? Corruption is everywhere. Um, corruption is not um, sort of an exclusive domain of the Dominican Republic. However, sorry, I forgot to. What is unique in the DR? almost unique, is the level of impunity. The institution that I had now published this report in 2004. It was 20 years of impunity. Looked at 155 cases before that were before the courts for corruption. Of the 155 cases, only six reached a final decision. Five were acquitted, and one was sentenced for a misdemeanor. That um, official, PRD official, by the way, um, was eventually pardoned. So this was 2004, almost 10 years ago. We're about to, go to issue a report, a new report, of corruption uh, without punishment uh, in the next month or two. It looks at um, all corruption um, denunciations in the press, in Dominican press, from 2000 through 2012. 76 cases, more or less. Of those 76 cases, very few individuals have gone to court, have been tried, have been sentenced, and those few that have are all lower level officials. There is no high level official in the Dominican Republic that is serving a sentence for corruption. None. Now, right now, for example, one of the things that um, is noted by a lot of people is how President Medina uh, looked to Brazil uh, during his campaign and um, uh, said that Brazil was a model to follow. As you all know, in uh, President Dilma's first two years uh, in office, she fired seven cabinet ministers for rumors of corruption that where they could not prove uh, 
how they achieved their, their assets. There's no one, no official, in spite of um, the many allegations that has yet been fired or that is in being investigated before a court. And it calls to attention also that if you, I visited the anti-corruption unit four months ago or so. Anti-corruption unit has six prosecutors, um, about eight vehicles, about 10 um, officials, uh, um, security uh, members of the security forces that can accompany the attorneys throughout the country uh, for these very difficult cases. Um, they lack basic, basic resources in order to persecute, to um, go after corruption. Um, now, um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to cut this shorter uh, because there are um, okay. judicial independence. Um, I cannot prove to you, I can't show you one document that will um, demonstrate to you that the judicial power uh, lacks the high courts, lack political independence. I, I can't prove it to you. However, I am reminded of that old uh, saying, um, you know, the duck test. If it walks like a duck, if it squawks like a duck, etc., you know it. Um, there are many instances, for example, the Sunland case, which is a case that was um, a um, government contract um, for a loan um, that was 132 million, more or less, uh, loan. Um, it went up before the Supreme Court um, in 08 because um, the, the, the allegation was that it had not received a congressional sanction approval. Well, it, the person involved was a very influential member of the government who is currently a senator. Um, the decision of the Supreme Court at the time uh, was basically said, yes, there was a violation, very short set sentence, but yep, yeah, should have gone before the Congress. However, the, um, the people bringing the, the, the case before the court have no legal standing. And because they do not have any legal standing, we dismiss the case. The case was absolutely dismissed. Um, such as that, I can, um, go through several other cases, none as notorious as that one, but other cases. And in case, in terms of political issues, the Electoral Tribunal recently, last year, year and a half, has um, automatically, almost systematically um, awarded, given in its decisions, the head, the current head of the PRD who, it is alleged, has, he's the one who signed the Blue Ties Pact with President uh, Fernandez in 2009. It is alleged that he um, has basically uh, achieved, uh, reached an agreement with the official uh, party, with the government, and um, he is not opening the party up to a convention, an open convention um, as such. We will see it's slated to be held in February. But what is, it's telling is that all, of, all decisions of the high courts are in his favor. Um, now, the most to me, serious situation, however, is the Dominican economy. Um, I'm not going to have time now to go through this. Um, the, what, the average taxes, whether it's individual or corporate taxes or value-added taxes, the level of inefficiency or evasion um, or exemptions 
are such that the Dominican government, the, the fiscal pressure is much lower than it should be, than the average in, in, throughout Latin America. Um, as you can see, it sh they should, Dominican government should be collecting 7.5% of GDP between income taxes and VAT. It, 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 I'm sorry, it's, it's collecting 7.5% when it should uh, be collecting 11%. Um, 272,000 jobs were created between 2000 and 2012. Of these, the state was responsible for almost 60, for 65 percent of them. The Dominican economy, economy is not creating the jobs that is required um, in order uh, for growth, real growth, to, uh, to take place. Um, And here is an issue which is at the core of the deficits. Um, you see the light green area um, there are the interests on the debt that the central bank has to pay for the banking crisis that happened in 2003. The bank banking crisis President Mejia, at the time, made the decision to pay all account holders, regardless of the amounts that they owed. This amount of money is growing, and there is no solution. The government has, as of yet, uh, to find a solution as to how to address this ever-growing issue. Now, what does this mean? What this means is that public debt is between public debt and subsidies for electricity and other issues, more than half of the budget is going into those two sectors, and only, as you can see, 191 million pesos into um, public services. Um, this is a, a difficult, rigid situation that um, we definitely uh, needs to be addressed. And in order to address this issue, you need vibrant political parties. You need political parties that are democratic, that hold um, conventions open and uh, allow um, the, the winners to be based on merit, uh, to rise up through the ranks, and that is what is not happening now, even within the PLD. The PLD, the 27 members of the political committee have been in office, have been leading the PLD since 2006 now. And they themselves, um, well, they were uh, 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 re-elected by the Central Committee, but they, uh, at their behest, until 2016, 27 individuals. Now, what they're talking about is increasing the membership by six. And the debate is who will be the three that President Medina will uh, nominate and the three that President Fernandez will propose. And I'm going to um, close at the moment uh, by saying, uh, look, President Medina has the highest standing at the moment uh, of any president in Dominican history. I think it's 88 percent, according to Mitofsky, uh, political consultants. Um, you know, you can't argue with um, at that level of popularity. Um, and, um, um, but the PLD is an essential party to Dominican democracy, as well as the PRD, both of them. Both of them need to open up, both need to democratize, and the law that um, that Carl mentioned, the law on political parties is fundamental. Without that law, there is no accountability whatsoever for the political parties. On financing, um, the monies they receive, the uses of those monies, whether it be state money or private money. Uh, so that is a, an essential law. Another one is a law on sworn statements of um, net worth of public officials and um, illicit enrichment. Those two laws, the political parties law has been in Congress for 14 years and neither, none of the parties 
have really wanted to approve it. None of them. Um, but it is essential now. Look at what's been happening, I'm sorry, to the deficits in electoral years. Last year, uh, last one on the right, and 2008, presidential elections. The use of state resources have been rampant. And I'm not saying this. You can look at the OAS reports going back to 2004 and even before that. So this is not just the PLD, but as well the PRD and other parties that have uh, misused state resources. So those two laws are essential in order for accountability um, to take place. And the opening up, the democratization of the leadership, of the election of the leadership of the PLD and the PRD, both parties, is fundamental. Thank you. Um, usually at this part of, the, of, 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 of um, our events, I would ask a whole bunch of questions. Um, but we've gone over a little bit, and what I wanted to do is sort of skip that, that portion and, and just open it up for questions from, uh, from, from, for the, from the audience uh, and sort of start a conversation, which I think uh, you would appreciate. So uh, I open it up to you now in the audience. Um, the microphones up here in the front. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity. I mean, to just ask. wait a second. Why don't we try that microphone and see? Maybe it's a volume issue or. I think they're too loud. It's going to do the same thing. Um. Okay. One, two, one, two. Still the same. Hold on one second. Thank you. Better now. Good. Okay. Just thanks. Hold it away from you now. Oh, okay. There you go. Perfect. Uh, well, as uh, Director Carl, how do you pronounce your last name? Mission. 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 Already said. Roberto is a uh, ambassador, former ambassador. Roberto Alvarez is a knowledgeable person, well familiar with the work of the foundation for the Global Foundation as a close pre friend of President Fernandez and as a former ambassador, well familiar with the Dominican government guidelines towards corruption that he pointed out and as he properly recognized it's a problem for probably all over Latin America and probably worldwide problem. So uh, we just want to hear uh, Ambassador Alvarez's uh, position about the other works, like the academic works and cultural works that the Global Foundation perform in the Dominican Republic, as well as the official government position to where those uh, problem he pointed out. Thank you. you can ask for more questions. Let's, let's, take more que let's take more questions from the audience and, and we'll answer them all, uh, all together. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Flavio Medina. I'm for the PLD, represented here in the tri-state area. And I'm here with the president of the party, which is Francisco Cruz, sitting right there to my left. Uh, we just want to make some statements uh, because uh, we are not agree with the notion of one state, uh, one party state that is uh, presented today in this presentation. Um, we have many reason why we disagree with this. And one of them is, uh, uh, the first government of the PLD was in 96-2000. Um, President Fernandez, uh, after 
2000, he didn't promote any constitutional changes to stay in power. However, uh, when the uh, PRD won the presidency in 2000, they were the one who promoted changes, constitutional changes, for the only reason to stay in power. So when we won again the election in 2004, uh, President Fernandez had the option to be reelected because the PRD was the one who promoted that change. Um, so we did. And also because we fulfilled good governance, something that the PRD never done in the Dominican Republic for the 14 years that it has been in power, the office. And yes, they promote a lot of corruption. This is something that we should be debating in a different forum because we are talking about a lot of things. We're throwing everything in one basket. And we're talking about political reform. We're talking about uh, the, uh, economic issues. Um, we're talking about corruptions. I think we should be debating this separately. Uh, I want to thank uh, 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 Robert to Arbores, who uh, I know for many years already. Um, and also I want to recognize uh, his uh, professionalism and his capacity. But uh, coming back to business, um, we believe that the reason why the PRD is in the opposition is because of a problem that is rooted deeply within the PRD party. And one of the problem is the, the lack of institution. They, they don't, they don't work to strengthen the party with, from within. So, so it's a weak party. They have a lot of division. They have a lot of groups. And at the end of the day, nobody knows who's going to support who. And it's, it's really a mess. And the second reason is, uh, uh, they, they need to come up, they need to come up with, uh, promote a leadership within the party. They don't have leaders and, and the PRD. And, and this is not the PLD falls that this is happening. This is not the people fault that this is happening. This is not even the country. Okay, we can promote a, a, a party law that it was promoted in 2000 during the, uh, during the uh, Hippolyta Mejia government. And they didn't pass it to the Congress because they didn't want to do that. So now they want to force the PLD to do it. Once, once we are, well, all we have done is trying to, to, to pass the law and to promote changes that benefit the majority of the people. So uh, I want to cut it right there, but uh, I just want to say that um, um, it is uh, amazed me in a way because um, uh, Roberto Alvarez was uh, ambassador to the OAS during the government of PLD. Um, um, talking about corruptions, uh, I think we all have to share, to share uh, a piece to share in, in that sense. And this is something that has been going on for many years. Uh, he showed a book, and I would like to know uh, when that book was published, because he go back 20 years. And if it was published in 2004, that means uh, the big piece of the share is not even part of the PLD government uh, when we were in office. And uh, also, uh, uh, President Fernandez, we want to claim ultimately that this is part of the campaign from the PRD internationally to damage the reputation of President Fernandez and to damage the reputation of the PLD because President Fernandez it most likely is going to be elected again president in 2016. And they're starting with this campaign since the Dominican Republic. So uh, we want to claim that publicly, uh, and I hope you can take that to the bank. Thank, thank you very much for your opinion. Uh, do you want to respond to that or more questions? Um, sir, in the middle, here. Сергей Костяев, uh, Russia, Moscow scholar. Uh, we also have huge problems with corruption in Russia, and uh, we share this uh, uh, disease, let's say. I have a very simple question, a couple of, maybe, several years ago, uh, there was a free trade, ag trade agreement between Dominican Republic and the United States. Did uh, that uh, free trade agreement had any positive effect on economic and political development in Dominican Republic? Thanks. <coughs> One question over here. Uh, real quick question, Roger Noriega with the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, uh, congratulations, Carl, on the terrific work and Ambassador Alvarez on your presentation. I mean, uh, President Fernandez has a very good reputation in the United States and is considered a good friend and this is why it's, this is sort of a, uh, an important but sort of surprising uh, uh, revelation. Um, 
when you see, and everybody understands that the, his party is very popular and in the current president, PLD president is very popular, but when you see 2010 elections, congressional elections, where they win 41% of the vote, but get all but one of 33 senators, I mean, there's clearly something sort of a, a unusual. Um, and one specific question on, the, recently the Washington Post wrote about a Supreme Court decision uh, disadvantaging Haitian uh, uh, descendants uh, who are Dominican citizens, uh, essentially calling uh, into question their citizenship. Uh, and tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands, uh, may lose their citizenship and their right to vote. Uh, I, this is, I'm not quite sure about this, but um, friends of mine have told me that the, uh, the Haitian person, uh, Dominicans of Haitian ancestry are overwhelmingly uh, PRD supporters. Is there any, uh, do you have any sense of whether uh, this uh, decision was politically motivated? Does, does the PLD have that kind of influence? And is there any empirical evidence that they have that kind of influence over the way the Supreme Court might have ruled? Thanks, Roger. Uh, any other questions before we answer? Okay. <laughs> um, look, Funglode does uh, a lot of good work. Is that what uh, I, I've taught at uh, Funglode? And uh, so, um, what can I tell you? Um, now, that is the reality. And uh, now, another issue is the questioning that has taken place as to how, where the funds came fr from for the construction. There, have been, there were allegations that undue influence was used on contractors in order to, uh, now all of these cases were dismissed, or dismissed uh, through the courts. They went through the court system and uh, that's what happened. Now, um, uh, the PRD, I, I think um, that maybe Flavio was not listening all the time that I was talking uh, because I clearly said that this is an issue, corruption, that has uh, taken place in uh, the Dominican Republic uh, throughout sort of many years. And I said this report was published in 2004, and it was 20 years of impunity. So it would have been 1983 or 4 to 2004. Um, so, you know, you, you can, you know who was in power through those years. Now, the thing is, that this level of impunity continues today, okay? And it doesn't happen, that level of impunity is not the same everywhere, okay? I can point to countries where former presidents have been in jail in Latin America, or have been, or many cabinet ministers. I mentioned the case of, of Brazil, okay? So what I'm talking about is impunity. The level of impunity is rampant in the Dominican Republic. And until we overcome that, un understand it and overcome it, we will not be able to eliminate all of the economic woes that we have, but in addition, even drug trafficking. For example, we have no drug cartels like you have in Mexico or Colombia. It's not that way th that it happens in the Dominican Republic. It happens, you cannot move a leaf in the Dominican Republic without the security forces, the armed forces knowing about it. So, um, until we address corruption and people start going to jail for corruption, there is recently, uh, the, the other day, you may have seen in the Wall Street Journal, an allegation that, um, that in the sale of the, of some airplanes that uh, a Dominican colonel was paid off. Um, well, I hope that it, you know, I hope that it's investigated and this is a serious allegation. I hope, you know, we'll see. Um, now, uh, in terms of the Constitutional Court, uh, um, I don't know of any evidence whatsoever that has been politically tainted. 
um, none whatsoever. There have been allegations to that respect, but I know of no um, credible evidence to that respect. Um, the, uh, the decision is, um, I find it disastrous personally, I think unacceptable. Uh, we have issued, the institution that I represent has issued a statement to this respect um, and um, I hope that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is going to the Dominican Republic soon, hopefully. Uh, they're uh, negotiating a date um, and um, hopefully a solution will be quickly found to the situation uh, based on the Constitutional Court's decision and the commitments that the Dominican state freely assumed when it signed all human rights treaties. Sure, and uh, you know, I would just elaborate, um, just with just with facts. Uh, the perception is, is clear that you know there is a dominance of the PLD in every branch of government. I mean, just the number numbers wise. So you have thirty one of the country's thirty two senators or PLD members. Uh, you have the National Council of Ma Magistrates, the body that appoints the country's judiciary and prosecution, uh, prosecutors being mostly of the ruling party. Then you have the majority in the, of the Congress being of the ruling, ruling party. And then you have the vice president of the country being the wife of the, pr of the former president. I mean, these are just facts. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's factual. I mean, I'm not arguing the why, the how, but that's just the fact. Uh, on the issues that have to do with the FTA, I would say that the more that there is an environment where you question the regulatory strength, that it's, it bodes poorly for people wanting to invest in Dominican Republic. And we do have a free trade agreement, which is a very positive thing. It was done when, when you were uh, Assistant Secretary uh, Roger. And uh, it's a positive thing, you know. I mean, and this is something that Americans all over uh, the political spectrum, uh, they, they like it, they promote it. It's, it's good for us, it's good for Dominican Republic. But if you can't really rely on how uh, you do business in the DR, uh, it becomes less and less attractive of a place to go uh, for, uh, for commercial interests. Okay, thanks very much. And I have to um, say that I'm really happy that uh, the CSI is taking so much of interest on the DR. So in less than a week, we have two events on the DR. So this is something and new. And this is the ambassador. The oh, the ambassador. Dominican Republic. Yes, I'm <laughs> Aníbal de Castro, ambassador of the DR. Yeah. And also, I want to congratulate you for the new offices. I mean, this is wonderful. <laughs> it's very and, uh, you know, Corruption is a problem in the DR. I mean, we can't deny it. And we have to work to try to correct it. We have to find solutions. We have to fight against impunity. I mean, there is no doubt about that. We all agree on that. But uh, also, we have to look at uh, corruption as it is in the DR. And I would say that uh, it's a system based on a coalition, coalition of forces. And that's why the, the, the last report by the State Department of the DR, when they talk about corruption, it says that corruption comes from both the public and the private sector. And uh, if you look at the polls in the Dominican Republic, corruption never comes to the forefront. It's one of those forgotten issues in the agenda, in the political agenda in the country. So that's why, you know, for the people in the Dominican Republic, so there, there isn't a strong current of thought against the corruption because it's not important. Because people look at corruption as, as a part of everyday life. That doesn't mean, as I said before, that we don't have to fight against corruption and they have to fight hard. And I think that Danilo Medina is doing that. I think he's doing that. Roberto, my friend, mentioned uh, these allegations coming from uh, Brazil on the Tucano's uh, 
uh, sale to the DR, right? And it's being in investigated in the Dominican Republic already. So this is a good sign. And let's hope that we'll see some results. On the other hand, I can't comment on the report that the Dominican Republic becoming a one-party state because I haven't had the opportunity to read it and to study it. And I don't want to make the mistake of many people concerning the sentence passed by the uh, uh, Constitutional Court, that they are talking and talking about the sentence and they haven't read it. So they are talking hearsay and that's why there are so many misconceptions about, about the sentence. But uh, I'm going to say a uh, politically incorrect phrase, chercher la femme. So if you look at the appendix of the meetings, if you read the names, it will be very hard for me to say that this report is not biased. Out of uh, 14 names, 10 names or nine names belong to people from the opposition sex with the DR. And I want to, to, to say something about those people. So, because all of you probably you don't know those people who they are. First of all, Fausto Rosario Lames. He's a friend of mine, he's a journalist, a journalist, but also he's, he was the ghostwriter for Hippolito Medina in the last electoral campaign. Henry Molina, well, belongs to the private sector. Roberto Alvarez, he's independent. Francisco Ito Dominguez uh, Bisonó. He's of the party, the reformist party, allied of the government, but he's against that alliance. He's been very outspoken against the government. Orlando Remera incorrectly said here that he's a Secretary General of the Partido Revolucionario Dominicano. No, he was expelled from the party and that, uh, uh, and that was upheld by the Electoral Court in the Dominican Republic. Guillermo, Guillermo Caran is also another dissident. Guillermo Morena and Cristobal Rodriguez, they are together. So Guillermo Moreno is a person who is obsessed with the persecution of President Fernandez. And he's the one behind uh, the allegations that the Fundación Funglode was used for, you know, is based on uh, corruption. So I don't think he's a very relevant source if you want to, to have an independent opinion about what's going on in the Dominican Republic. Jorge Subero Isa, he was a former president of the Supreme Court, but also he's very unhappy because he wasn't re-elected to the post. Luis Abinader, he belongs to the PRD. Hipólito Mejía, well, he's the fitter candidate for, for the PRD. And Jose Monegro, he's a journalist and I have no complaint about him. So, nine out of 14. Can we believe that this is a non-biased report? I don't know, I have to read it. Thanks very much. No, I, I appreciate uh, you giving your perspective of the uh, folks that we met with. Um, we met with, as you know, we met with the uh, president of the Constitutional Tribunal. We met with uh, the member, uh, the, uh, a member of the uh, Junta Central Electoral. We met with uh, uh, Henry Molina, that works for the president. Uh, we, we made a very concerted effort to meet with folks in the government, folks that were dissenters, as you mentioned, and we met with folks in the media and the civil society. So uh, it's not like we're, I mean, and, and usually people in the civil society are folks that f speak freely and have uh, a different kind of agenda than you would say folks uh, in, in, the, in either the party structure. Uh, and, and we heard some pretty strong things, and I think that in the interest of, of, of trying to keep things pretty fact-based and moderate, uh, we omitted a lot of statements going from either side that, you know, as you know, sir, because these things happen in the DR, there's a lot of gossip and rumor and allegations. We tried to stick to the things that we thought had the most substance behind it. Um, and um, so, so that sort of explains that. We, we you know, I don't make uh, any sort of apologies for the group. I think that it was a very diverse group that we met with. and. Uh, of course, 
we look forward to your, uh, to your comments. I mean, it'd be great to hear what your views are of, of our report and our views. And as, as mentioned, this is the first of two events that we will be having. And we would love uh, you to have a, a prominent role or, or if there's anyone that you would recommend for that next uh, session, we welcome that. Oh, sorry. May I suggest that you invite someone from the official sector to, to talk about uh, this uh, Constitutional Tribunal's uh, ruling? We, we have submitted invitations to the President's office already. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're, we are going to take... Uh, hold on. Hold on one second. How many people want to ask questions so we can sort of... All right, so we are going to go with these last four? No, just, just a quick... Uh, and, then, then, and then we're going to have to shut it off, because we have yeah. gone over, and uh, I think this has been an, an excellent session, and I wouldn't want to uh, stop anyone from giving their opinions, but I only see four hands, and I'm going to take four hands, and that's it. Oh. Okay, thank you, Carl. Hector Shamis, uh, Georgetown. Uh, this is just a general comment. Um, the, the issue, aside from uh, corruption, I think corruption in the region is a symptom, a symptom of deeper things, number one. Number two, whenever you go to any data set on the easiness of doing business, uh, and corruption is a symptom of the difficulty of doing business in Latin America, uh, regulations, permits, all, all the, th the things you, you mentioned there, and, and, and the Dominican Republic is pretty much in the same neighborhood with it many, many countries in the region. Uh, th and this is important because it highlights that the current uh, economic growth in the region is overwhelmingly based on, on the commodity boom. Uh, given all that, you go to the World Bank, you go to uh, Bertelsmann Transformation Index and so on and so forth, the, the difficulties of doing business, of investment, of getting the permits, of dealing with corruption and so on and so forth, all of that suggests that when prices change, and price, prices always change, and we've seen these booms in the past, uh, then there are many, many countries that will not be able to sustain this level of growth uh, on the, on, on the, in, in this context. And it will come down to those countries that have credible rules, uh, predictability, and, uh, and, and an and investment-friendly climate, and so on and so forth, low corruption, however you want to call it. I'm saying this because this has, you know, has had in the region this incredible boom in terms of trade that many countries have not seen in history or, or in many generations. Uh, once prices change, uh, it's going to be a, a complicated political situation because this boom, this e excess uh, amount of resources that m many countries have had over the last five, ten years, uh, have, have all, all this boom has trickled down over politics. Uh, and has allowed many governments to think, uh, to, to, to play around with institutions. Uh, and, and, and to use that to, uh, in one way or another, manage to stay longer in power than they were originally elected or, or perpetuate the dominance of the party, however you want to call it. And, and this is the moment in which uh, the economies are going to start slowing down and the polities are going to become unstable in Latin America. And, and, and we're talking about, you know, the moment uh, the, the cycle begins to change. And this is looking forward at uh, an even more pessimistic, perhaps, uh, perception, but something to start looking at and start worrying about in anticipation of, you know, bad years to come. Thank you. In the middle here. Uh, Ralph Nurnberger with Georgetown University. Uh, first, your report is excellent, and uh, your opening comment raised a question, and that is, what can the United States do uh, to try and deal with this problem? Uh, and the second problem is narco-trafficking. Is there anything that can be done to reduce or eliminate that? My name is uh, Jonathan Russin. <coughs> My law firm, Russell Vecchi Heredia Bonetti, has an office in the Dominican Republic, and we face these questions of corruption on a daily basis. Um, Ambassador Alvarez, you have been studying um, uh, corruption outside the Dominican Republic in a number of other contexts. I think uh, here in the United States, as I look around, 
and I look at the difference between what our administrations have done with the first savings and loan association scandal in the United States and what the current administration is doing uh, with the mortgage scandal of um, uh, 2008. Um, my question is, is it really a top-down solution? Does not the executive himself have to demonstrate a resolution not to tolerate um, uh, corruption in order to be able to weed out the system. You looked at the example in Brazil. There, it's the president uh, who has made the effort. As you look at the Dominican Republic, is the only way that you can really get to corruption by having the top person in the government make it no longer tolerable. Um, thank you so much for um, having this discussion today. My name is Regina Morales. I'm um, a graduate student at American University. And my question, um, you touched on it for just a moment, is about uh, civil society organizations within the Dominican Republic. Um, you spoke about the impunity of high-level officials and um, the lack of accountability in the country. and in many ways, um, civil society is seen as kind of the demand side of demand side of accountability. So I was hoping you guys could speak a little bit to the um, how active civil society is um, within the country. Okay. Um, the Dominican Republic is not one of those countries that has benefited from the commodity boom. Um, that is not where we, um, our, our major exports are not any of the ones that South American countries. Actually, this is one of the uh, ways that the two Americas are sort of have been differentiated. There is a, a very good study that the IDB did on uh, two Americas, uh, two speeds, two Latin Americas, uh, two speeds. One, the commodity-driven uh, South America, and another one's those closer, those countries closer to the United States that depend on a number of other, um, um, their economies depend on tourism, remittances, um, and now in certain, a number of them also mining. Mining is becoming a very important uh, a very important component. Um, now, where the Dominican Republic is going, to, where we're running into an issue has to do, uh, the 2008 was, uh, paradoxically, was a boom for countries uh, because of easy credit. Quantitative easing in the United States opened up a flow of cash. Um, and a lot of money flowed, but also the private sector loans were easy to get this is changing, as we all know. Interest rates are going up, starting to go up in the developed world, and um, the sources of funding is going to dry up. For a country such as the Dominican Republic that has been depending on deficit financing, it is going to, the crunch is coming, inevitably. Um, right now, President Medina has, um, um, their, his target for this year, de deficit target, is 3% um, um, of GDP. Uh, last year, it was, we don't know. Some, uh, the IMF at one point said it was 8%, up to 8%. Um, but the thing is, we have not been told yet exactly what the deficit for 2012 was. We don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, th th this is a, a difficulty in, in how to um, sort of transit this particular cycle that we're going to go through. Um, the, I'll leave the U.S. and narco up to you. Uh, the, um, I think, Jonathan, you're absolutely right. Um, until the president, you know, steps down on corruption and sends a strong, the strongest signal. 
we're not, and that signal sh needs to be accompanied with the resources for prosecutors to be able to go after corruption until you have both. Um, business as usual is going to continue, unfortunately. Um, I just don't see in a country where presidential power is so large, so vast, so important, uh, the message from the president has to be unequivocal, unequivocal. Um, and civil society, you know, I, I, we, the institution that I, I, I preside now, um, decided many years ago that it would be just for one year, that, and we shun the term president or secretary general. That's why we call ourselves coordinators, <laughs> general coordinators. And fortunately, it's for a year because there's no cons more consuming work than voluntary work. You get paid not one cent. Um, we get phone calls from the press from international organizations, tons of calls every day. And the reason that the journalists themselves and the international organizations tell us openly is there is no political opposition, no real viable political opposition. So the pressures on civil society are much greater than ever. Um, so, um, is there a vibrant uh, civil society? Somewhat, but still dispersed. And very, uh, and usually most of the NGOs are very focused on one issue and um, not enough linkages across uh, themes uh, in the society. Uh, regarding your questions, I would say uh, what, what the U.S. can do uh, to deal with uh, I guess the drug trafficking and the other issues, uh, the corruption, which is what came out. I'd say on the drug trafficking, um, the focus on the country's ill-policed coast as a drug transit area is a big issue. So maybe working together to beef up uh, their maritime borders would be uh, an area uh, that we should be focusing on. Uh, as far as other issues dealing with corruption, I think uh, these are Dominican problems, and they demand Dominican solutions. The people of Dominican Republic should be at the forefront of all this, but I think the United States can play a role uh, as a partner, especially in the uh, working and workings that have to do with the, uh, the political party law and any issues related to that uh, in order to sort of create a, uh, a fair uh, sort of even playing ground for all of these parties. Uh, I think that a lot of the issues that have been raised today uh, are positive. I think this conversation should be happening in the DR. Uh, and I think that as, as, as much as we can serve as a framework or as a stage to have that happen and build awareness, I think we're doing our part and I think that's really positive. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's Dominicans that need to be leading these conversations. It's Dominicans that need to be coming up with these solutions, coming um, uh, to conclusion on some of these difficult issues. Uh, it's not going to be easy, especially given that this has been going on for such a long time and there's so many entrenched interests. Uh, so I would just uh, highlight that. I want to remind everybody once again that the report is on our website. It's at csis.org forward slash Americas and it's under the publication section. I want to thank Roberto for your time, for going over. Uh, the time that we agreed on, and I want to thank all of you for coming uh, to this launching. Uh, we appreciate it, and thank you very much. Thank you.